Other than that, Wolf, picture-perfect launch. The astronauts are on their way to a rendezvous with the space station. The reality is simple. They're 220 miles up in space. The fire department's not coming. No one's coming to rescue them. The astronauts and cosmonauts are on their own with three options. Resolve the crisis, abandon the station, or die. Fortunately, no one's life is in peril this day. You see, this is a full-scale mock-up of the station at the Johnson Space Center. We kind of um, have like this little chicks network set up, I think. Uh, for the EVA, I've compiled a list of things I thought might be interesting to you and the rest of the ladies. Nicole Stott spent three months on the International Space Station. I'm sitting over here in the commander's seat, and on, of course, the final flight, this is where Mark Kelly sat on liftoff and when he brought her in for that final landing. Wolf. Which raises the question, uh, John, how will NASA get astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station? Commercial vehicles. For the next four to five years, the Russians will be the only way once shuttle is retired. You'll be able to look through the glass in the front, through the cockpit. It's all going to depend on the displays. But I tell you, for the workers here who have been fortunate enough to stay uh, and finish up these jobs, it's been very, very difficult. Yeah, well, you know, it's the first time that they tried it, uh, and it's exactly what it was, target practice, see how this chem-cam, as they call it, uh, worked. And at the top of the mast on uh, Curiosity is where the laser sits. Uh, and, you know, it shoots out up to about 30 feet. And I have a little rock here as an example. Now, if I were to put a, just a tiny mark, a size of a pen mark, that's actually bigger than the mark that the laser leaves. He is a veteran of six total space flights, serving three times as pilot and three times as commander, including two missions to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, Curtis Brown. He is a five-time space shuttle astronaut who has logged more than 1,600 hours in space. He flew as mission commander on two, including STS-96, the first ever docking of a space shuttle to the International Space Station. Kent Rominger. We are here to celebrate with John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, truly American heroes. But we would be remiss if we did not also honor as we sit here, Alan and Gus and Wally and Deke and Gordo. And the United States planned mission to Mars is ready to take a significant step forward about 16 hours from now. NASA is set to conduct a test flight for a capsule called Orion. If all goes according to plan, it will one day take humans to Mars. CCTV's John Zarella is at the Cape Canaveral launch site in Florida. I'm John Zarella, at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Behind me, a Delta IV heavy rocket, and on top of that, the Orion spacecraft, set for its first test flight tomorrow morning, 7.05 Eastern time. This is a huge, huge day for NASA. Orion is the future of the U.S. space program. Eventually, it will take humans around the moon to an asteroid and perhaps one day to Mars. On this four and a half hour flight, the unmanned craft will reach a height of 5,800 kilometers above the Earth. Orion will then dive back into the atmosphere. At 30,000 plus kilometers per hour, its heat shield, the largest ever built, will take the brunt of temperatures reaching some 2,200 degrees Celsius. Now, during a news conference here just a little while ago, NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden talked about the future and how going to Mars had to be an international effort. He was also asked about a trip he made to China last month, where he talked with officials from the Chinese space program about potential involvement they would have in the future. I, I would love to, but I won't. I, I won't bite. Tomorrow, the very first test flight of the Orion spacecraft. It is, as NASA says, something they cannot downplay. I'm John Zarella at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The sun. 60 years ago, scientists first proposed a mission to study it. Back then, the technology simply did not exist. It can mitigate it. Now it does. At least, that's the hope. During its seven-year mission, the Parker Solar Probe will orbit the sun two dozen times, its closest approach within six million kilometers of the surface. That's seven times closer than any spacecraft ever. 
So why a trip to study the sun? Well, the more we know about it, the better we can understand how life developed here on Earth. And because scientists say the sun does some head-scratching stuff. Off the surface in the corona, temperatures are thousands of degrees hotter than on the surface. Laws of physics say that shouldn't happen. And little is known about solar winds that begin as a gentle breeze but zip by Earth at hundreds of kilometers per second. Disturbances in this solar wind, called space weather, can interrupt communications, change the orbits of satellites, and... It creates a hazardous environment for astronauts. And in the most extreme case of these space weather events, it can actually uh, affect our power grids here on the Earth. As the Parker Solar Probe makes its closest approach, the spacecraft's state-of-the-art carbon heat shield must stand up to temperatures of 1,300 degrees Celsius. Onboard sensors keep the heat shield lined up just right. It basically has to always be sensing whether or not uh, the heat shield is in the right position and correct itself if it isn't. Parker will pass through the corona at a stunning 700,000 kilometers per hour. At that speed, you could fly from Washington, D.C. to Tokyo in under one minute. The probe is also carrying a microchip containing more than one million names. Star Trek actor William Shatner promoted the sign-up effort. This summer, we're going to touch the sun. Going to a region of the solar system never before explored, Parker is considered one of the most daring missions of discovery ever undertaken. John Zarella, CGTN, Cape Canaveral, Florida.